Welcome to season three of Writing in the Tiny House. We spent seasons one and two building an entire library of episodes that you can reference regarding tips and tricks and advice on how to write fiction. For season three, we are taking a different approach. We are rolling up our sleeves and we are diving into short stories that have been in the public domain as a way to demonstrate what this entire process can look like. For season three, we are doing collections of episodes all regarding one short story, including a reading that I will be doing for you and then a few more episodes after that where we have a guest and we discuss the various different things about that short story that work and may not work so that you can learn what to look for in your own writing to become a better writer. Thank you for tuning in to this week's episode of Writing in the Tiny House. Hey guys, before we get into the bulk of this episode, I have something to announce just really quick. Writing in the Tiny House podcast now has a merch store. So if you are looking for anything from t-shirts to backpacks to notebooks and more for yourself or for that special person who is interested in writing or really just to have, go ahead and follow the link in the description to get onto that writing in the tiny house merchandise store. These items cannot be found anywhere else. And so for you and for a loved one, go ahead and jump on to that website and find all of the things that you want there. Everything purchased through this shop goes directly to supporting this show. So even if you don't want to or you're not in a way to become a patron to donate every month, go ahead and purchase one of these items and support the show in that way. Okay, let's get back to this episode. Welcome to the discussion episodes of this series on Agatha Christie's The Plymouth Express Affair. A reading of this short story is season three, episode two, so be sure not to miss that. I am Devin Davis, I am the host of this show, and I am also a fantasy author, and I am here with Chrissy Barton, who will be joining me throughout this series. Hey there, I'm Chrissy Barton. I'm a certified copy editor and owner of Little Syllables Editing, and you can find me at littlesyllables.com. While Devin and I share a love of literature, I think you deserve to know that we are also lifelong friends. So welcome aboard this in-depth analysis of Agatha Christie's The Plymouth Express Affair. This discussion is about to leave the station. Okay, welcome back to this third episode of this discussion on the Plymouth Express Affair by Agatha Christie. And Chrissy Barton from Little Syllables Editing, are you still with me? I am. You are. What are we going to be talking about today? Now we're talking about dialogue. The dialogue. (laughs) (laughs) Is interesting. Chrissy, Chrissy and I were talking about this Outside of this recording, obviously, there are some th- like we we talk about ideas before we dive right into to an episode, at least a little bit. This short story is so dialogue heavy and yes. it is it is everybody talking. They are saying all of the things instead of thinking them. There is no body language. There is no like, (laughs) there is no look, there is no gesture, there is no like storming out of the room or anything that could imply attitude or or whatever. Like you have to glean everything, absolutely everything from what people are (laughs) saying. And so if we compare this to a modern short story, what is the trap that dear Agatha Christie is falling into? The talking head. Talking heads. And what is talking heads, Chrissy? Well, it's just, they're just talking. That's all they're doing. <laughs> and and you you lose track of who's talking because there are so also aren't a lot of dialogue tags. And um, yeah, they're just talking. They're not actually doing anything. Right. When I when I think of talking heads, I think of like a sock puppet 
talking to another sock puppet. The author is not taking a break in between the words that people are saying as a way to, you know, let us let us in on expression or on, like I said, body language or moving right. like there's there's not a sense of space as to where they are in regards to each other let alone in regards to where they are in the room um mm -hmm. how they're interacting with their environment that doesn't happen at all in this story yeah there's very little of it yeah there's very little of that and so i was i was talking to chrissy earlier i mean like we we say this in the intro of every episode episode two i do a reading of this short story and i was just talking about the challenges of doing a reading when there are no dialogue tags and there's no prose and there's no narration in between the words that the characters are saying just because if you are relying solely on the the reading that I performed for you or that somebody else might have performed for you, all you have to clue you in is the voices. And so mm -hmm. in this in this particular short story, you have Poirot, who has a French accent or a Belge accent. And then you <laughs> have like these other English accents, which are kind like, I'm not going to lie, they're not all easy to do and right. and so if you don't nail your voices it, it's super easy for a listener to feel lost and to lose right to lose where they are in between all of that dialogue yeah I mean even as a reader there were times when I had to go back and trace it back and figure out wait who's talking now right. <laughs> I have to go back to the last dialogue tag because they don't appear very often so listening to it would be even worse. Yeah. I mean, unless you your voices are amazing. Right. Unless the voices are amazing, which they are. <laughs> of course they are. <laughs> no, but like one little hiccup that I ran into specifically was when Poirot was speaking to the maid. There is a section in, in that little exchange where the maid is saying about five short paragraphs all of this like and it's all her talking so she's oh. she she like in her words is quoting someone else and then oh, quoting yeah. herself and because she's quoting they're all different paragraphs <laughs> but but it it stacks up as like five tiny paragraphs that it that uh -huh. are all said by one person and oh, I see that yeah. I know isn't that fascinating how much that trips a person up. And so I was going through and reading that and I misunderstood some of the things that she said. And I thought that Hastings had actually jumped into the conversation. Yeah. Because I thought that we had suddenly switched over to some first person narration, which is Hastings. And right. now he was in the conversation and when I that got carried away with that, it didn't make any <laughs> sense. And so, I mean, like you said, you had to go back and read some dialogue tags and then just kind of do the every other thing. I had right. like in this particular chunk, I had to go back and pay attention to quotation marks. The quotation marks is two marks. What's the one mark? Is that a different, is that a different um, word? That's, when there's a quote within a quote, yes. you use a single quotation mark. Yeah. So Although I the, the funny thing is that I think in British English, it's usually opposite what American English is. Oh, and if, but if in, you're reading the French, they don't actually use them. <laughs> oh, <laughs> and in this version that we were reading, it must have American punctuation. Right, which is fine, but yeah. I had yeah. I had to go back and yeah. look for the different quotation marks that suggested right. that, you know, the following words were also spoken by the same person. Right. And that was tricky. I had to go through into my, like I have a printed copy of this and I had to block that <laughs> off as all being yeah. the same voice <laughs> when yeah. I, when I did, you know, when I did the reading. Right. Nice. I know. Isn't that super great? It is super great. It could be fun to listen to that part with Hastings in there. <laughs> <laughs> right? Just to make things confusing and weird. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
I like that. <laughs> My goodness. So Chrissy, just taking this short story as just kind of, I mean, this is not a perfect short story. It is definitely a fun short story, but I mm-hmm. love that it is not perfect. I like, right. I don't know if our, if our listeners know this, but Agatha Christie eventually turned this short story into a full-blown novel about four years later. This short story became number five of the Poirot series, which is called, like, what is it called? The Mystery of the Um, Blue Train. Yeah. Uh Uh-huh, The Mystery of the Blue Train. And so it's kind of like she read this or she wrote this and had it published and then wasn't satisfied with it and decided to pad out all of the rushed parts, which there are a lot of rushed parts, Mm -hmm. and there are parts that definitely needed more narration and stuff, and turn it into a full-blown novel. And so I think it's okay to, like, see the points where improvement happened so that we can, so that we can learn from, um, so that we can learn as writers what to avoid. So so again, just to summarize, like what are some of the tricky parts like with this talking heads problem and a lack of dialogue tags and a lack of sense of space? I think, you know, like filling it out and turning it into a novel gives you so much more space for characterization and maybe to give those emotionless characters more emotion. And also, I'm like with the dialogue and the missing dialogue tags. It, I mean, when you're making it into a novel, you definitely can't do it that way. I mean, you would just be the pacing would be ridiculous mm-hmm. because it would just be like boom, 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 just like one thing said after another. But you wouldn't ever see any setting. That is the thing about this is you don't ever see any setting, which maybe we'll talk about later. But Right. We'll talk about that in the next episode. Yeah. So I don't know. I think I think there's a lot that is lacking in the short story because it's just all dialogue. <laughs> right. It is wall to wall dialogue. And yeah. the thing is, as a reader and I'm. I don't know. I'm really sensitive to this type of thing just because I am such an auditory person. Mm -hmm. I am the person like I'm the guy when I read a thing I am hearing Mm -hmm. like I don't just see the word and attach meaning meanings to the word without attaching the sound first. And when I I know it's interesting, right? And so when I go through and I read something with just so much dialogue, I get tired and to (laughs) right and to have the breaks allows me to just kind of like rest is it like is it like you're just like in a room where people are just talking and talking and talking at you (laughs) no it really is it really is or it's or it's like the little eight-year-old girl who like won't shut up and tells you about like her whole day (laughs) and you can't like figure out any context or anything else like Uh there is no place there is no anything but she (laughs) won't shut up it's kind of that relationship <laughs> with this short story. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> At least a little bit. And so yeah. having a moment where the characters s- shut up. And so, do some stuff. And do a thing. <laughs> Um, Uh it definitely builds my relationship with the characters a little bit better and it gives me a better sense of space and a better sense of who they are. And just as a reading experience, it lets me step back and breathe and, you know, fall into narration and prose because like, that's another really big part of any story. Yeah. At least to me, that's a really big part of a story experience for me. Right. And that all comes back to pacing. Like, like when you want to slow the story down, you add more description, you add more, you add more. (laughs) And in this short story, it is like bare bones, I feel like. And And it is all in dialogue. She's taken all of that other stuff out. And so it's just like conversation. And then there's like a line break and then here's a new conversation and there's a line break. Here's a letter. Line break, you know? <laughs> right. Like, <laughs> yeah. So, so it, it moves really quickly. Yeah. It, it moves at breakneck speeds. And like another little thing that I just noticed 
that I want, I mean, you were talking about pacing and I was talking Mm -hmm. about the importance of narration and they go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. There are points in this story where, and it wouldn't have taken up any more room to do this, where the person who is commanding the the conversation, which is usually Poirot, Mm -hmm. he goes through and tells a person to do something. And in his words, you understand that those things are happening. Whereas what would have been better is if the narration said that instead right the, yeah. there's a little section where he was telling hastings to like gather up some things and move over here or something i don't remember what he said and yeah and his spoken words don't ever stop <laughs> like he he <laughs> his thought pattern doesn't stop and so you know that those actions happened but it would have been super great to just end the spoken words and let hastings actually do the thing Right, because Hastings is there. Hastings is the one telling the story, so why can't he say, and then I did this? Right, so I did this, and whatever, right? Right. And so, like, in that way, the dialogue, I mean, and it wouldn't have taken up any more room. It wouldn't have added more word count. It wouldn't have added anything. It just would have been a different way to it, a a different way to do that, just because... I don't know, in my own writing, my own writing is really dialogue heavy. Like I love, I love conversations and I love people talking mm-hmm. about the things. And right. um, however, when the words start to replace good narration, or dare I even say mm-hmm. necessary narration, like it's, it's just something to be aware can happen. And mm-hmm. we see what it looks like here in this story. Right. I think it makes the characters feel a lot more passive. Like they're not doing anything. They're, it's, <laughs> it's almost like they're just standing in an empty room talking to each other and there's no action, which maybe, you know, maybe that's part of Poirot's character because he's not really a man of action. He's a, he's a thinker. Right. And isn't he kind of an older gentleman? But, yeah. Yeah. I mean, like 50s or something. Probably. Right. I mean, yeah. it, it seems that nowadays these whodunits, we have to spruce them up with a lot of action sequences, but yeah. whodunits don't actually need to have that in order to be a good whodunit. And these Poirot right. ones are that, like there's not a lot of action-y things. Like right. there, there doesn't have to be the big chase or whatever, but. Right. Yeah, but I do think it it makes the like this dialogue heavy thing makes it makes the characters feel more passive. And you don't want your characters to be passive unless you're doing it really intentionally. I mean, if they're supposed to be that way, then by all means make them feel passive. But right. when they're the ones driving the story, they need to do something. Right. I mean, when you <laughs> when you have 5,000 words of solid dialogue, yeah. It, it seems that a different approach would have been great sometimes. Yeah. Which maybe is why she filled it out and turned it into a novel. Yeah. And There's I'm glad that she more did. action in the novel. And that is it for today. Thank you so much for joining us on today's episode of Writing in the Tiny House. If you are interested in supporting this show, and if you are interested in following me on social media, all of that information can be found or at least accessed in the content of the show notes of this episode. Also, for every guest that we have on Writing in the Tiny House, all of their professional information, all of their social media stuff, and the website to their business or whatever it is they do is also found in the description in the show notes. So thank you so much for tuning in for today's episode, and we hope to see you again soon.